Hello, everybody, and um, yeah, thank you all for, for, for turning up in person and uh, online. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to introduce today our very own Yael Engbers, who's been with us since 2017. Um, but she began uh, her academic career way back in 2010 with a uh, bachelor's degree um, at Utrecht University uh, in Earth Sciences and uh, stayed at Utrecht to do a master's degree uh, specializing in geophysics uh, starting in 2014. And in both her undergraduate and master's degree, she did projects involving paleomagnetism, uh, and one of them involving going to the Andaman Islands, which must be very nice. And uh, yeah, she joined us as a PhD student in 2017, working in the geomag and, and deep groups. And uh, she's done an absolutely great job with her PhD, as you will all be hearing about. Um, and uh, now she's working as a PDRA. Uh, with us uh, in part on a, a NERC large grant that's studying um, mantle circulation and using paleomagnetism as a, as a signal to, to constrain that from uh, the bottom up. Uh, so when Yael joined, she had a choice of um, uh, four projects, but she was very intent on one in particular that involved both um, uh, field and lab work and also um, modeling as well. But I think it's the former of those things that you're going to be talking about mostly today. Bit of all, great, even better. All right, thank you, Andy, for that introduction. I'm just gonna minimize this so I don't see myself. <laughs> um, hello, everyone, um, I'm Yael Engers, uh, and as Andy said, I'm a postdoc here at the Geomagnetism Lab. Um, I recently finished my PhD, and I would like to thank Janine and Caitlin for giving me the opportunity to present my work that I uh, did during my PhD research. Um, you might notice that there's a slight change in the title here compared to the title that was um, emailed around because I found that actually my entire thesis doesn't really fit concisely in a nice 30 to 35 minute talk. Um, so I'm focusing today mainly on the research that involves the South Atlantic anomaly, which is a weak patch in the geomagnetic, geomagnetic field uh, in the South Atlantic region. Um, and I am researching that phenomena through different uh, methods. So let's start a little bit with some information on Earth's magnetic field for the non paleomagnetists here and in the Zoom chat. Um, so we have a magnetic field here at the surface that originates from the outer core of the Earth where convecting iron is uh, creating a self-sustainable geodynamo. And this magnetic field comes all the way to the surface and all the way outside of the atmosphere to the border of the magnetosphere. Uh, and it protects us from solar radiation from outer space. And it helps us navigate and is very important for all our technology. And um, when you average the magnetic field over a long enough time, the idea is that it averages to an approximate dipole, so a bar magnet with a north and a south pole. But realistically, it does vary over latitude, longitude, depth because it's a lot stronger when you're closer to the outer core, for instance, than where we are at the Earth's surface. And it also varies through time. Um, we express the magnetic fields um, using strength, so the strength of the magnetic field that we're experiencing, the inclination, which is the angle with the horizontal, so how steep it points into the Earth, and the declination, which is the angle with the geographic north. As you can see here with the images of the compass, uh, the declination is the angle with the north, and the inclination is how steep it points into the Earth. So a little bit about this geocentric actual dipole theory, which is that if we average our magnetic field over sufficient time, it averages out to an approximate dipole aligned with the Earth's rotational axis. Um, if this is the case, which it's, we assume it is, this is very important for a lot of studies that we use paleomagnetism for, like blade reconstructions. Um, it would suggest that the inclination is related to where on Earth you are, so, and the magnetic field strengths as well. And then we can describe the inclination with this relationship with the latitude. We use paleomagnetism, which is the study of the Earth magnetic field through geological time, not only to know more about the magnetic field, but also to know more about deep Earth through the geological time period. Because we have geology to study the Earth's surface through time, and we have seismology and other geophysical data to study the inside of the Earth right now. 
But other than the knowledge of the magnetic field changing, which originates in deep earth, there is no way to tell the history of deep earth. So we use the fact that rocks capture the magnetic field when they cool down in their little iron oxides um, that then record the geomagnetic field for us through geological time. In my study, we mainly use volcanics, which are really good captures of the magnetic field. There is multiple ways to study the geomagnetic field, and my thesis uses a lot of them, <laughs> but not all of them. Uh, and the one is the main straightforward one is paleomagnetic data. So you go on field work, you collect your rocks, in my case, volcanics, and then you take them to the lab where you measure their direction, so declination and inclination, and their intensity. So this is a spot reading of the magnetic field of the time when this rock was formed. This is me and Andy, I think. <laughs> we use the declination and inclination, so the directional data, to then create something called a virtual geomagnetic pole, which is basically that if this direction is the truth or this location, and we do have a dipole field, where would the geographic North Pole be if that is the case? So all directions create a virtual geomagnetic pole, uh, which makes all the directional data better comparable for the whole global data set. The second way to study the geomagnetic field is to then use a scatter of all those poles, all those virtual poles, to decide how variable or to study how variable this field was. This is called paleosecular variation. Secular variation is variation over time and then throughout history of the Earth is paleosecular variation, um, for which we use the scatter of those VGPs, we call them. And we can do that for one location, as we did for St. Helena, but you can also use the whole global data set for a certain time period to study the relationship between that variability of the field and the latitude of where on Earth you are. And that is a way to statistically describe the field behavior of a certain time area. And then the third method used in my thesis um, is through field models, where we use a global data set to create either time varying field models like Gotham one here in the right corner, or time average field models, which I used like one for the last 3000 years. Um, and it's important to note that this is an inverse problem that we solve. So we have a lot of data and we find one of the many non-unique solutions that could have been the magnetic field. So remember, this is not one true answer, but it does clarify if certain features are possible with the data that we have, or if they are very likely with the data that we have. So Earth magnetic field today shows a weak patch in the South Atlantic, and that is the topic of this talk and of my thesis. And I use all these methods that I just mentioned to study this. It's called the South Atlantic Anomaly, and we're basically wondering if this is a recent feature or if it's a feature that has been a recurring aspect of the field over time. St. Helena is the red star, which you can see is within the weak patch. So this is basically the field strength of the Earth in 2015, um, where if it was a perfect dipole, it would just be weak at the equator and strong at the poles. But you can see that here in the South Atlantic, it's a lot weaker than we expected. And also in St. Helena, there is somewhat weaker field than we would expect for a geocentric actual dipole. But also very important to note is that the directional variation is much higher um, than we would expect. So your compass would point 16 degrees west of the geographic north when you're standing on St. Helena. Why this South Atlantic anomaly is important enough to do a whole thesis about, and not just my thesis, but many other studies, is for many reasons. One is that it's a potential link to activity in the lowermost mantle. If the South Atlantic anomaly is just part of a recurring feature over a very long period of time, it is most likely related to activity in the lowermost mantle and uh, the outer core actually moves too fast to create such long-term features or anomalies. Uh, John Torduno suggested in 2015 with his co-authors that um, there's, an, uh, there's something called the large low shear velocity province in the lowermost mantle under Africa, which is a feature where seismic waves move slower than through the rest of the mantle, and that this edge of the LLSVP, so that's long, large low shear velocity province, 
coincides with something that we call a reverse flux patch on the core mental boundary in the geomagnetic field. And this reverse flux patch is what causes the south Atlantic anomaly at the surface. And they are suggesting that this can't be a coincidence and that this steep edge of the large low shear velocity province or LLSVP is causing turbulence in the outer core, which then creates anomalous features in the magnetic field at the core mental boundary and at the surface, which we now call the South Atlantic anomaly. This is the paper that they published about this. Other scientists suggest that actually what we see today is part of an upcoming reversal. So that the weak, the weak patch in the South Atlantic anomaly is getting weaker and weaker and slowly the whole field gets less stable and leading to a reversal of the whole magnetic field, which means that the North Pole would become the South Pole. This is super important for us because it can take about a thousand years and our magnetic field would get very unstable and very weak and we would miss a lot of protection and our technology would have to be adapted a lot. And then there's a the question that if the South Atlantic anomaly is actually so often recurring or even constantly present, is the GAD hypothesis, so if you average the magnetic field over a long enough time, uh, does it become a averaging to a dipole? Is that still the case or is that actually an over assumption? So here's some of the papers that came out in the last couple of years, all about the South Atlantic anomaly, including my paper from 2020 and the very recent paper from uh, 2022. Here is the model that I showed you previously. It's from the last 400 years. And you can see that it is, in fact, not showing the South Atlantic, South Atlantic anomaly here around 1600. Um, so that already shows us that the South Atlantic anomaly has not consistently been present. So this is the radial field at the core mental boundary. And what you can see happen around 1900 is that this reverse flux patch at the core mental boundary that I talked about before is appearing right now, east of Africa, and then moving westward to its current location, where it forms the South Atlantic anomaly that we see at the surface. So the question is, is it just a one-off and possibly leading to a reversal, or is it a recurring feature that has been around for recurring uh, for many multiple million years and possibly linked to mantle features in the deep earth? Why we think it's linked to the mantle is because the mantle moves very slowly, whereas the outer core moves very quickly. So if it's been recurring on multi-million years, it is most likely linked to features in the mantle. Right here, you can see this thing called the LLSVP that I discussed, which there's one in the Pacific and one in Africa. Um, and this LLSVP has been around for 10 million years. We do know that. So if this is one of the causes of the South Atlantic anomaly, it's most likely been a recurring feature for at least 10 million years so on a multi-million year timescale, which is why my research question is, was there recurring anomalous behavior in the Earth's magnetic field in the South Atlantic on a multi-million year timescale? So everything that I did in my thesis regarding the South Atlantic anomaly is trying to answer that question. And here are the different ways that I tried to do that also forming my four different chapters. So first we took the St. Helena data, uh, St. Helena samples and it performed a directional study, creating a declination and inclinations for each lava flows that we uh, used to study also the paleosecular variation at St. Helena. We performed a paleo intensity study to check the field strength at St. Helena when uh, it was formed, so between 10 and 8 million years ago. Um, I created a new database called PSVM with all the directional data from the Miocene, which I then used to create the first time average field models for the Miocene called M101, which I used to check for a South Atlantic feature. Um, I also used this database to check and study the statistical behavior of the field during the Miocene, but I won't be talking about that as uh, I'm limited in my time. Here is St. Helena, beautiful island. We were very lucky to get to go. Uh, it's about 2000 kilometers west of the African coast. It's about 120 square kilometers in surface. And uh, this is me on fieldwork in January, 2018. The geology of the island is rather straightforward. It's all volcanics. 
the island consists of two different volcanoes, one called the Southwest Volcano and one the Northeast Volcano, um, which then consists of different shields. So there's a, the upper shield of the Southwest Volcano, the mist shields and the lower shield. And then the Northeast Volcano uh, is the older one. The ages vary from about 10.5 to 8 million years old. Uh, when I started my research, we thought it was a little bit older, but then our own argon argon dates showed that 10.5 was about the oldest samples that we collected anyway. We collected over 50 sites from all these different shields and over 360 samples. And the first way to study the magnetic field in St. Helena was through directional data. So we gathered a declination and inclination for each lava flow, so each spot and moment in time in a geomagnetic field, and then turn them into this thing called a virtual geomagnetic pool. The way we do that is by demagnetizing our samples stepwise, so heating them up to slightly higher temperatures each time. First, you get a natural remnant magnetization that you find, which gives a direction. Um, so this is the magnetization of the sample, and this is then the direction in something called an orthogonal plot or a Seidefeld diagram, which shows you um, the steep words, like, <laughs> not, that's not a word, how steep it is, the inclination and the declination. So basically this axis is both the west and all the way up, and this axis is uh, just the horizontal and the north, and then down and east. And each time we increase the temperature, the sample gets slightly more demagnetized and the direction gets closer to zero. And then we end up with a beautiful direction. And why we do that is because some samples have a magnetic overprint. They've got it through time, maybe because it was slightly heated or something else happened to them. They are 10 million years old. So, so if we wouldn't stepwise demagnetize them, we could gather the wrong direction. For instance, in this sample that has an overprint, if you wouldn't stepwise heat them up, uh, you would get the wrong direction. Whereas this is actually the direction that the field had uh, while the sample was formed. So we took at least five samples per site to create the direction and made sure that these samples all get the same results per site, uh, giving us a declina declination and inclination for each of those sites. And one side is, generally speaking, one lava flow, so one moment in time for the geomagnetic field. These are all our directions. And um, this is something called an equal area, equal area plot, where had the angle with the zero is the declination. So here they're all pointing north, here they're all pointing south. And then the further inwards into the diagram you go, the steeper they turn into like point towards Earth. So it makes sense that St. Helena is quite close to the equator. So they're all quite horizontal. Inclination is not very steep. Um, and then they have samples that show the field while it was normal and the field also reversed during the island was formed. So there's also reverse directions. And we even see one reversal within our data. These purple Sites or results all come from somewhere called Prosperous Bay, which is the youngest set of lava flows on top of each other that we collected, um, where the bottom flow showed a reverse direction. And then we had two transitional directions. And then the top flow uh, of these four flows showed a normal direction. So you can clearly see the field reversing while this volcano was active. The second thing we did with this directional data is turn them all into VGPs and then plot them like we see here. All the VGPs, uh, so all the virtual geomagnetic poles plotted together. And then we discussed the variability of the field while St. Helena was formed. So the scatter of these poles make up the variability of the field or paleosecular variation. When we look at this a little bit more closely, we see it's actually quite scattered uh, the dispersion is 21.6 degrees, which doesn't mean anything yet, but it will in a second. Um, but the average direction, this purple star, is actually not very far from the geographic north. So even though it was a very varied field, the average still points to a geocentric actual dipole. And then the current pole, this light blue plot, 
is actually not much of an outlier compared to all the other directions. Um, whereas we're currently in something called the South Atlantic anomaly, but you can see that for St. Helena's history, the current situation is not, not an extreme. When we compare this VGP dispersion that we uh, calculated, the 21.6 degrees, with the global data set over the last 10 million years, which I plotted here versus latitude, you can see that all the data of the last 10 million years follows the trend of latitudinal dependence quite neatly. So this is all the data collected, uh, separated into 10 degrees latitudinal bins separately for the Pacific and the Atlantic hemisphere. The green are the Atlantic and the blue are the Pacific hemisphere. And the red star is St. Helena, which is basically the only data set with such a high VGP dispersion compared to where it is on the planet. This suggests that the field of St. Helena was significantly more variable than anywhere else in the world during that time or during the last 10 million years. So the conclusions of our directional study and also my first chapter of the thesis was that the direction on average does not disagree with the geocentric actual dipole, but St. Helena shows a much more variable field compared to the last 10 million years, which is in agreement with the recurring anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic over a multi-million year time scale. So on to the second method used, which is paleo intensity. The same set of uh, samples were used uh, for our paleo intensity study, where we basically try to gain the knowledge of the strength of the Earth's magnetic field when St. Helena rocks were formed. This is, however, experimentally a little bit more complicated, uh, so a much lower success rate. Um, what you have to do is you rely on this relationship between the magnetization that sample gains and the field that it's given. So we have a natural magnetization in the samples that is reliant on the field that it got 10 million years ago. And we stepwise give it a new field, a new magnetization with a field in a lab. And we do that by first demagnetizing it by heating it up in a zero field, and then giving it a magnetization at that same temperature by heating it up in a lab field. And we continue to do that stepwise after which we get that relationship that we then use in combination with the known lab field to calculate the magnetic field of the earth when the samples were formed. However, usually your samples are not perfect carriers and this relationship isn't perfect. And you need to make sure with selection criteria that you're actually calculating the true magnetic field of the earth. So we check for alteration in the samples. We make sure <clears throat> So that these, this relationship forms a straight line and isn't too zigzag, and that the direction actually shows a true direction and that we're not measuring something uh, like an overprint or something wrong, basically. This is an example of the sample, one sample that didn't make it, for instance, because it was very zigzag. So something happened in the sample during heating that could have altered our results. This is an entire list of selection criteria that I'm not going to go into, but it's a lot and they were quite strict, which then led to only a 13% success rate in my results. Um, with five lava flows that gave us three or more passes or three or more successful results with a standard deviation under five microtesla. Doesn't seem like a lot from 50 lava flows, but uh, it's absolutely more than nothing. And all those five results uh, were quite coherent. They all gave very low paleomagnetic field strength. So here under F is the field strength measured in microtesla. And you can see the highest result is 13.7 microtesla. And on average, we gained a 10.5 microtesla for the field strength in St. Helena. Currently, the field strength in St. Helena is 29.1 microtesla. Of course, we can't make this direct relationship or comparison because the whole field was a lot weaker during the Miocene. So we calculate something called a virtual actual dipole moment, which is basically just the relationship between the field strength and the latitude or uh, the inclination, making it possible to compare it to the global data set of paleo intensities. So the inclination dependence or sorry, latitudinal dependence wears out of it. And when we do that, we compare it to the Miocene because currently the field is much stronger than it was then. And still St. Helena shows a weaker field or a weaker moment 
uh, than the average in the Miocene. Here you can see all the data known for the Miocene where the yellow dots are St. Helena. Giving us the conclusions for the paleo intensity study, St. Helena was formed in a time where the magnetic field was very weak at that location, which gives us further evidence of the recurring anomalous behavior in the magnetic field in the South Atlantic region on a multi million year time scale, which was also chapter two of my thesis. <laughs> Um, moving on to the time average field models, the third way of studying the magnetic field and that I used for South Atlantic anomaly research. Um, again, very important to note that this is a non-unique solution based on a large data set of direction, basically giving us one of the possibilities uh, that satisfies the data. A little bit about what we do, um, because there are so many options of satisfying this data. We damp towards a starting model, which in our case was the geocentric actual dipole. We describe the magnetic field using spherical harmonics, which are using Gauss coefficients, um, which to explain this simplified is a way to describe a sphere like a sinus and cosine describe a wave. Um, the Gauss coefficients have an order L or N a degree M. So basically GLM. And for instance, G10 is the dipole. And the higher this order and this degree gets, the more detail we can use to describe the geomagnetic field. And then those Gauss coefficients go in this long equation that we're not going to get into that then describes the geomagnetic field. So our time average field models use all the declinations and inclinations that we have for a certain time period, in this case, the Miocene, and then come up with a set of Gauss coefficients to uh, describe the morphology of the geomagnetic field. This is the magnetic time average field model published for the last 5 million years by Cromwell and others. Um, it's called LM3, and it does not show the South Atlantic anomaly quite clearly. However, it's also really damp, so it really kept it very close to this uh, GAD model, and there was no data in the South Atlantic region. Um, so we wanted to see what the time of its field for the Miocene looked like, and then we could include St. Helena as well as a data point. To do this, we collected all the published directional data of quality volcanics from the Miocene. There are 1,454 sites uh, from 44 different localities, and we called this data set PSVM, Paleocellular Variation of the Miocene, which we also used to test the geomagnetic field behavior for the Miocene, uh, which is in my thesis, but will not be discussed today. Um, we use PSVM to then create the first time average field model for the Miocene, which we called m 10 one A little bit about the data set. Here you can see all the different locations. Um, important to note that we do have data from the South Atlantic, making the models there a little bit more trustworthy. They are all volcanic directional data, and we used all these different search engine Scopus, Google Scholar, and Magic, which is a paleomagnetic search engine, uh, to go through 1,500 studies to collect this uh, data set. And we corrected for the plate movements that we are known uh, for the Miocene. This is the geomagnetic polarity time scale, which shows, for the Miocene, which shows that there were a lot of reversals. So we have a lot of normal data and a lot of reverse data and also a lot of transitional data during reversals that were excluded with a cutoff. We created separate models for the normal and the reverse data because a lot of uh, researchers have suggested that there's actually a big difference in how the field behaves during a normal and the reverse time. So here is our normal model M101N and our reverse model M101R. Uh, and again, this is the radial field at the core mantle boundary. So two important things to note. One, they both show this reverse flux patch that I discussed previously that could cause the South Atlantic anomalous uh, behavior on the surface. And two, they're not actually that different, especially considering this is a non-unique solution and the data sets aren't the same. They show very similar behavior, um, which is also why we combined all the data to then create MTEM1, uh, showing very clearly these same reverse flux patches in the Atlantic region. Um, so the fact that this shows up in normal and reverse and our combined model, and also when we use different priors to GAD or different damping parameters, 
shows that this is not the truth. We don't know for sure that these reflux, reflux patches were there, but it's becoming more and more likely, and it's definitely not proving that they couldn't have been there. So what we can conclude from this study is uh, we created a new paleodirectional data set for the Miocene, which we used for the first ever time average field model for this time period from five to 23 million years ago. And that all versions of our model show a reverse flux patch in the South Atlantic region, causing anomalous behavior at the surface. This is consistent with the directional and intensity study of St. Helena that I showed you and all point towards uh, recurring anomalous behavior in the South Atlantic on a multi-million year time scale. So the conclusions of my thesis that talk about the South Atlantic region are a paleodirectional data and the paleocircular variation show anomalous behavior or more variable field in the South Atlantic region because of the high VGP dispersion, but an average direction that is actually not disproving the geocentric actual dipole theory. Uh, the paleo intensity data shows very weak results at St. Helena, so between 10 and 8 million years ago in the South Atlantic. So there is a, a more variable and a weaker field in the South Atlantic when St. Helena was formed. And the time average field model show not well, show the possibility and likeliness of a reverse flux patch that was frequently recurring in the South Atlantic. Um, also agreeing with the average data. Um, all of these can conclude into a very high likeliness of recurring anomalous feature in the South Atlantic region in the geomagnetic field, most likely related to lowermost mantle activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yael. That was a really great um, talk, really yeah, clear and, and very exciting results as well that you've shown. Um, do we have any questions? Ask Elliot. Um, with your, your school, I think we'll yes. uh, you know, I may be reading John to apologize on that one. Obviously, you've got the, uh, the, the bit in the South Atlantic. Mm -hmm. uh, the section that's over South America, that wasn't there in the original one before you put your own data into it. Um, do you have any idea of where what's forming the last part of it, or is it just a part of the South Atlantic along the North as well? Or? It could very well be South Atlantic anomaly that we see today. It also shows two reverse flux patches now, but a bit more east. We do know it, it, these features move around. Um, it doesn't show up in the reverse data set. It does show up in a normal data set. It's, yeah, we, again, this is non-unique, so we don't know for sure it's actually there, but it it's, looks like, if we go back, do we have somewhere to... Field now. If we... Oh, sorry. So the question was <laughs> wait, then I go back to the end. <laughs> the question was um, about this reverse flux patch under South America, um, whether that is also related to the South Atlantic anomaly or if it comes from somewhere else. Um, and yeah, the answer is that, of course, we don't know for sure, but the current uh, situation at the core mantle boundary also shows two reverse flux patches that cause the anomalous behavior um, in the South Atlantic at the surface. So it actually matches quite well with what we see today causing the South Atlantic anomaly. Do we have any more questions from uh, Ms. Nordness? Mary? Can they not hear me? They can't hear the questions or they can't hear me? Okay. <laughs> I will repeat the question. So you, yeah, that's all. Yeah, you described it as a reoccurring anomaly. So is there evidence that it disappears and reappears again? Like what time scale would that be on? The main evidence is that we know from historical data and satellite data that it appeared around 1900. Yeah. So it hasn't it definitely hasn't always been there, but we don't know how frequently it appears, or maybe it just disappeared that one time and it's always been there before then. Um, we don't really know. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. 
it was a really great talk, Kel. I really enjoyed it a lot. And it was great to see all your results all and how they all fit together and stuff. So um, I guess uh, I have a bit of a weird question, probably. But um, so in your paleo intensity study, you have this 13% um, success rate. And I just wondered, is there anything you can do about that? Um, like, if you got more samples, would it help or better samples or do you need to go to a different place like what 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 could possibly be done to improve that um a few things so the question just to make sure is uh, how can i improve my success rate for the paleo intensity study um one is i started as a first year phd student so obviously i i made mistakes and and uh you get better into guessing which samples are going to be a great success which aren't which method works for your data set um, another big thing is some, like material. So we had a lot more material. I could continue the sites that I know are behaving the way that we need them to, to gain pretty intensity results. Uh, it's also important to note that 13% is low. It's definitely not the lowest in this field. Um, so it's actually quite a decent result for the amount of material that I had to have five successes, uh, so size five lava flows that gave the, a good paleo intensity result. But yeah, definitely throughout the experiments, you gain knowledge about how your samples behave and how you can get the best results out. So more time and more samples. <laughs> and less exploding samples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you go to uh, slide 27, please? 27, wow, first. Um, actually, I'm not into geomagnetism or something like that, but um, you kind of made a conclusion based on these slides, which mm -hmm. is that um, most of the data you had, uh, you collected and uh, are in the graph followed a pattern. Mm -hmm. But because the St. Elena is kind of like an outlier, but I also see the uh, one of them, like Teti, who is also behaving like that. So why do you, do you think uh, there is kind of like relationship between that and the St. Elena? And do you think it is a, uh, it's something that you can use to conclude that St. Elena is actually uh, an anomaly here? Very good question. Um, so to repeat quickly, uh, St. Elena is not the only outlier in this uh, plot. They well observed, there's also um, this outlier, which is close to Antarctica almost. Um, so this is a global data set called PSV10, where different locations are combined into this uh, latitudinal bin. So I'm not entirely sure where this data comes from. The only thing to note is that here the outlier is where there's less dispersion in, in the full scatter, um, which could mean that the field was very stable in that region, like more stable than we would expect, and that would make it an outlier. But it could also mean that we didn't, that the studies didn't collect enough time. So basically all the lavas were erupted in a very small amount of time, uh, making that PTP dispersion very low because basically the field didn't have enough time to vary um, as we would expect it to. So definitely the, the outliers above the trend are more, significant because it's it's more difficult to suggest other reasons for that being an outlier than just the magnetic field being really variable. And I check in the chat because no one has been yeah do we have any further um, questions from the audience while we're here? Nope. Okay, sure. Thanks for a really good talk, Yao. Uh, what, what is like the nature of this irregularity of the the at the lower mantle? Like what what could be going on there? That is a very good question. <laughs> so the question is what could be going on in in the mantle? Um, just so in the LLSVP, uh, I'm not a mantle geophysics uh, seismologist. I'm not sure. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know if Andy has any knowledge of, of this. So I think the is hypothesis was that the large structure. I think the question is what is going on to create that large structure or did I misunderstand? I, I might have missed about the structure. So the seismic waves go slower through this structure in the mantle. Okay. 
uh, was the question, how is that related to the magnetic field or how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, I uh, the origin of LLSVPs yeah. <laughs> is is a very contentious issue. Um, even the properties of them, are, you know, aside from having a slow seismic velocities, is and being hot. Everyone agrees that they're hot, but they may be chemically distinct. They may be purely thermal. They may be superplumes just rising up in response to subduction at the margins. Okay, but it is uh, yeah, it's a very hot topic, but one that Yale's yeah, postdoc will be will be addressing. So, okay. Uh, I will make them bigger. Uh, just, just to say, if anyone wants to know more about LLSVPs, Andy has some excellent recorded lectures for ENVS398, and they should get hold of those, and then they can learn all that they need to. Um, I learned a lot from him, so I meant to know about this stuff. A compliment to Richard. <laughs> it is rare, you should note it. Is there any other questions? Oh, there's a chat. Uh, open source those lectures, Andy. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I was also wondering how did you get your 1500 determination? <laughs> Lockdown. <laughs> Lockdown <laughs> helped a lot, yeah. Um, and basically, the way I did it was just go through the search engine, create a massive Excel spreadsheet with all the papers that I could find that had paleomagnetism and mycene or paleosecular variation and mycene or anything relating uh, this. And then just go for title based if I could exclude them, and abstract based, and paper based. But it was a lot of time. But the results are also really cool. So that makes it worth it now. <laughs> Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, then I'll draw proceedings to the close and we'll uh, thank you once again for an excellent talk. Thank you.